Hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show, where in this week's video, I'm going to address the question, is ageing the price we pay for cancer protection? So it seems that I have set myself an essay question, but I was at my desk thinking about the recent book I finished reading, P53, the gene that cracked the cancer code, and of one particular chapter in this book, which was Cancer and Aging, a Balancing Act. And so I suppose this chapter gave me a little bit of inspiration to make this video because I think it is an interesting topic to talk about and it will touch upon a couple of things I've referenced in previous videos. And so I could probably talk about this all day, but I haven't really got time to do that. So I'm going to break it down into sections. And I'm a simple person, so we'll keep it simple. Firstly, I'll talk about why I think ageing could be the price we pay for cancer protection. And of course, I'll also look at reasons why this might not be the case. And then lastly, I'll give my overall viewpoint and main take-homes from the video. And so I put a lot of thought into this video, but I know that there will also be some potential differing opinions. But I'm always interested to hear your thoughts as well. And I do enjoy reading your comments. So um, as always, share them below if you have any viewpoints. But anyway, what do I think? Is ageing the price we pay for cancer protection? So I'll begin where the book begins with my favourite protein, P53. Now, for those of you who don't know, P53 is a pretty famous protein. I mean, there's a whole book dedicated to it. And the reason why it's so famous is because, well, firstly, it is a very interesting protein. But interestingly, it is mutated in more than 50% of human cancers. And this may not be surprising once you understand the function of P53. So P53 is a transcription factor. It upregulates the expression of different genes within a cell. And P53 gets activated by a variety of different stress responses within a cell and coordinates different downstream responses, such as cell death or cell cycle arrest, depending on the upstream signals, to help mediate the stress in the cell. And if it can't mediate the stress, it can result in cell death. So in many ways, P53 is acting as a tumour suppressor. If anything goes wrong within a cell, it tries to mediate the response. And if it can't, it will prevent that cell from replicating and causing further damage, which could result in tumour genesis. So what happens if you don't have P53 in a cell? Well, back in 1992, Larry Donhauer generated mice that didn't have any P53. And what he observed was that the mice get cancer. However, what's really interesting is that in 2002, when Larry tried to regenerate these same mice without any P53, just using a different method, he accidentally generated mice with hyperactive P53 instead. And so according to the book, sure enough, the mice were well protected from cancer. But what was very surprising was that the mice seemed to age exceptionally fast. In just a few months, they looked like very old mice. They had hunchback spines, ruffled fur, grey hair, things like that, according to Larry. And they lived only about two thirds of their normal lifespan. So this bit of evidence would support that ageing is potentially the price we pay for cancer protection. And it's also in line with George Williams' theory of antagonistic pleiotropy. And this theory proposes that cellular damage and organismal ageing are caused by pleiotropic genes. And so according to this theory, pleiotropic genes are genes that increase the odds of successful reproduction early in life, but have deleterious effects later in life. And so P53 can be used as an example in this theory to show that it's beneficial early in life for protection against cancer, but the deleterious effects later in life is that it may cause advanced ageing. If you're interested in more, this review article here goes into a lot more detail about it as it also discusses another evolutionary theory of ageing, which is the disposable SOMA theory. But going back to P53, how is it promoting ageing? So a good way to understand the ageing process is through the different hallmarks of ageing. And so there are nine different hallmarks of ageing that can be split up into three different categories. The primary hallmarks, referred to as the causes of damage, antagonistic hallmarks, which are responses to damage, and integrative hallmarks, which are culprits of the phenotype. And so given that P53 is activated by different causes of damage, it's interesting to look at the antagonistic hallmarks and the integrative hallmarks. For example, one of the downstream responses of P53 is the induction of cellular senescence. And so one feature of cellular senescence is the arrest of the cell cycle. So the cell stops dividing. And so one reason why a cell might stop dividing is due to the shortening of telomeres 
that are on the caps of DNA. These telomeres help to protect the integrity of DNA and shorten over time during cell division. And so for these reasons, once a cell has replicated so many times, referred to as the Hayflick limit, the cell can enter cellular senescence. However, if P53 gets mutated or gets lost, cells can bypass this senescence cell cycle arrest and can keep growing, which could result in tumorigenesis and cancer. But this isn't the only hallmark of senescence. Another feature of senescence is the senescence-associated secretory phenotype. And so the secretory phenotype refers to a variety of different molecules that are secreted from senescent cells. These include pro-inflammatory factors and signaling molecules. And the current theories as to why there is such a secretory phenotype of senescent cells is thought to help in activating the immune responses to be able to clear senescent cells, which is beneficial for wound healing and development. However, if senescent cells are not cleared, it can result in chronic inflammation that can have deleterious pro-aging effects. And I've mentioned numerous times in this channel about senescent cells and their clearance and the impact, but just to point out one study, this study showed that in mice, removing the senescent cells delayed age-associated disorders. So summarising what I've said so far, P53 can activate a variety of different downstream responses, one of which is cellular senescence. And whilst these can have anti-cancer benefits, they can have pro-aging effects. And so this would be in favour of ageing being the price we pay for cancer protection. But what about arguments against this? So arguments against this would include either factors that are both beneficial for cancer protection and also beneficial for ageing, so as in anti-aging, or it would be the opposite, whereby it'd be a process that had severe consequences for cancer and also caused ageing. Now, regarding the latter, this is where the question I set myself gets a little bit challenging because cancer is an age-associated disease, meaning that the ageing process, whatever that may be, can increase the chance of cancer development. So I guess I could have also asked, is cancer development the price we pay for ageing? But that doesn't really make much sense because I don't think we pay to age as much as we would pay for cancer protection. Anyway, if we go back to our hallmarks of ageing, we can see that another hallmark is dysregulation of nutrient signalling. So as suggested by the name, nutrient signalling refers to different signalling pathways within and between cells that are active in response to nutrient levels. An important component of nutrient signalling is the protein insulin-like growth factor receptor, or IGF-1 receptor. And so this protein is normally expressed within a cell, and it plays a really important role in the regulation of cell proliferation growth, survival, differentiation, and cell motility. And so as you can see in this figure here, IGF-1 receptors bind IGF-1, and this can activate a signaling pathway, which ultimately promotes growth and inhibits processes such as autophagy, and prevents signaling of stress resistance, which can ultimately result in aging. So effectively, the IGF-1 signaling pathway is the same as that elicited by insulin, which informs the cells that there's presence of glucose. Different genetic manipulations of the signalling pathway that attenuate signalling through the pathway have been shown to extend the lifespan of worms, flies and mice. Interestingly, P53 apparently also suppresses IGF-1 receptor activity by reducing the endogenous levels of the mRNA that encodes the protein and it also stimulates the production of a protein that can inhibit the action of the receptor as well. In line with this, mutations in P53 that result in its loss of function are associated with higher expression levels of IGF-1 receptor and an increased risk of tumorigenesis. So pulling all this information together, it suggests that reduced IGF-1 receptor or signaling through this IGF-1 nutrient signaling pathway, as well as being able to suppress growth of tumor cells, has beneficial effects on lifespan. And this was further seen in a human cohort study of elderly Dutch citizens that showed that genetic variations that caused a reduced IGF-1 signalling were beneficial for old age and survival. So this seems to suggest that ageing may not necessarily be the price we pay for cancer protection. However, one thing that's a little bit unclear is distinguishing between longevity effects and ageing. And so maybe reduction of this pathway can extend lifespan, but the impact on ageing and health span may not be so clear. 
But these are still areas of research under investigation. So how can I pull all this information together? Well, I've given both sides of the story, both reasons for why ageing might be the price for cancer protection and why it might not be the price. And so obviously this video by no means covers everything that we know so far about this topic. For example, there's a whole area I haven't really touched on yet, which is how P53 can get post-translationally modified. What that means is that different chemical groups can be added to P53 and this can alter its activity. And one modification of P53 is acetylation. And this is regulated by SIRT1, a deacetylase that is also dependent on NAD plus levels. And both SIRT1 and NAD plus are both also very highly connected with the aging process. So my overall answer to this question would be to some extent, yes. And whilst that may not be necessarily the answer you want to hear because it's very unclear, I think it's more important to talk about potential factors that seem to be at the bottom of this case. And in particular, I hope this video has reinforced the importance of P53 in this complicated interaction. And so I'll be interested to hear your thoughts as well. Obviously, I haven't been able to mention everything in this video, but I hope from this you've been able to take away some insights into this very complicated and intriguing question. And as always, I hope you've learned something and thanks for listening.